Welcome to this lecture on the QP course. Today we're going to talk about error reporting and hypothesis testing. Now, got to be honest with you, Khalid said he much preferred me giving a live lecture, but I don't like doing that. I prefer recording lectures in advance and then I can edit out all the mistakes and all the waffle that I normally do if I'm standing in front of you. And that means that the lecture should actually finish on time. So that'd be a good thing, wouldn't it? I'm pretty certain that uh, Khalid has put on a really good spread of tea and coffee. So if you don't have one already, go and get yourself a cup of tea or coffee. I've got mine here uh, and let's make a start. So how is the lecture going to work? You should have a series of PowerPoint slides and your slides match those that I've got in front of me. When I start talking about a particular slide, I'm going to put it on the screen so you know which slide I'm referring to and it probably helps if you have your slides on at the same time as we go through the lecture. We'll start with the learning objectives, which is what you should know by the time we finish this lecture. So the first thing is to understand errors in the first place and the types of errors that you might see in data. And those are broadly split into gross, systematic and random error. Then we're going to look at central tendency, which is mean, median and mode. We're going to explain the difference between accuracy and precision. I bet that you're guilty of this too, using those words uh, interchangeably, because a lot of people presume they mean the same thing, but they mean completely different things. And so by the end of the lecture, you should know what the difference is between accuracy and precision. And more importantly, you should know how they relate to uh, systematic and random errors. If you can do that, then uh, that should be excellent for your interpretation of data that someone gives to you. We're going to look at data distributions, and I want you to understand why data are distributed in the first place. And in particular, we're going to look at the normal distribution. So I'm going to explain what it is and what information you can get from it. And the key information you can get from it is uh, standard deviation. And then we're going to look briefly at why distributions of data are used as the basis of hypothesis testing. I did in the past do a little bit of hypothesis testing, but I found it confused people. And I know that Gary Parkinson is going to teach after me about hypothesis testing. So I'm just going to explain the basics of hypothesis testing uh, based on um, div um, distributions. And I'm going to let Gary do the complicated bit when he actually takes you through some examples. OK. On the screen in front of you is a photograph of the book that I like to use for this lecture. It's called Pharmaceutical Statistics by David Jones. It's a really good introduction to statistics. All of the examples I'm going to use in this lecture are from this book. And I'm only using two or three examples. The book's got hundreds of examples and they're all pharmaceutical related. So I really do recommend if you've got the money to buy a textbook, investing in this textbook, because it really does um, support this element of the course. So let's consider errors in the first place and ask ourselves the question, why? Why do we care about errors and uh, what, why are they useful to us? The answer is that whenever you are doing an experiment, you're doing it to produce data and then you're going to interpret those data. In a QP role, for instance, you may not actually have recorded the data yourself. You're looking at data that someone else has presented to you. It's really important that you can look at those data with a critical eye because there will always be uncertainty in the data. When you're looking at data, you're trying to see either a trend in one set of data, or you're going to compare two different sets of data and say, are they the same or different? In either case, if the error or uncertainty is larger than the trend or the difference you're trying to see, then you can't interpret anything because <laughs> the what you're trying to um, use the data for is smaller than the uncertainty in those data. And so understanding what the uncertainty in the data is, is really important in, in terms of trying to understand and interpret those data. Uh, how do we determine errors? We determine them by repeating the measurement a number of times. The question then is, how many times sh should you repeat an experiment in order to be confident that um, you know the uncertainty in your measurement? I think if you asked any of our PhD students, they would say three, sir, is what I do. I record everything three times. And that is statistically enough to allow me to do all of my error reporting. Mm, probably not. I think we'd have to accept that three is the absolute minimum number of repeats that you might want to do for a particular set of experiments. Uh, and more would be better if you can. If you think about a dissolution bath, 
that's a good example. It has six um, individual vessels for recording experiments. And so you should really put the same tablet in each of those vessels, plus a control and a, and a reference. And then you've got uh, at least six sets of data, and that's a much better way forward. And, and more than that is, is better if you can. But it is difficult because sometimes experiments can take a lot of sample, or the instrument takes a long time to run, or it's expensive. And so you want to do the minimum number of experiments that you can, and three is the bare minimum needed to get some sort of statistical analysis on the data. But if you can, more than three is better. When you look at the data, you should be able to determine whether your error is a gross, systematic, or a random error. A gross error is something where the experiment has gone catastrophically wrong. So it could be the operator, it could be the instrument, maybe there was a power cut, the instrument is on its last legs, it doesn't matter what it is, something has gone so catastrophically wrong with the experiment that you're never going to trust the data and we are not going to consider data with gross errors in any further. We just have to accept that the experiment needs to be repeated and, and probably whatever was causing the gross error in the first place needs to be fixed before the experiment can be repeated. Systematic and random errors, on the other hand, are really important and they relate to precision and accuracy, as I'm going to explain in a moment. One of the key things that you might get out of this lecture is to be able to look at a set of data and determine are the errors systematic errors or are they random errors? Because if you can do that, it tells you something really important about the experiment itself and more importantly the person that did those experiments because it might not be you Martin it might be someone presenting you data so if you can look at data and you can say okay I can see a systematic or a random error in these data it allows you to go back and ask questions of the person that presented you the data in the first place we cannot really go forwards without you understanding what the difference between precision and accuracy are uh, many people use those words interchangeably and by the end of this lecture you'll realise that they do not mean the same thing and moreover you won't be using them interchangeably you'll be using them in the correct context that would be great. Precision relates to the spread of the data that means if you repeat the measurement do you get the same answer okay so if you repeat a measurement 10 times and you get wildly different answers 10 times you're quite imprecise. If you do an experiment 10 times and each time you get broadly the same answer it's precise. That's what that means. Accuracy, on the other hand, means how close the central tendency of your data are to the true answer. I fully accept that in some experiments you don't know what the true answer is, and that's a bit of a tricky one. But if you think about pharmaceutical examples, let's say, for instance, a tablet is supposed to contain 250 milligrams of an active. When you do an assay for drug content, the true answer is 250 milligrams. Uh, whether you get um, an answer of 250 or you get something like 245 or 241, doesn't matter. But the further away you are from the true value, uh, the less accurate your data are. So just to be clear, precision relates to the spread in the data and accuracy relates to how close your central tendency is to the true answer. Hopefully you can see, therefore, we can't really go and look at some examples of precision and accuracy without therefore understanding how to calculate central tendency, because we need that to determine whether the data are accurate. You probably are familiar with some of these terms. I'm sure if I asked you to calculate the central tendency in your data, you would do that by calculating the average. And another word for average is the mean, okay? But there are two others, median and mode, which we'll look at in a second. Mean is given the symbol mu, Greek letter for M, and it is calculated as shown on the equation on the screen. These equations always look a bit scary, don't they? But they're not really that bad. It's just that mathematical jargon makes them look a little bit unwieldy. So in this instance, mu, which is mean, which is what you're trying to calculate, is equal to the sum of, so that big E means the sum of your data points, X are your data points from one to N. So if you've got three data points, n is three, so it's the sum of your data points, one, two, and three, divided by n, which is the number of data points, okay? So you simply sum up your data points and divide by the number of data points. That should give you the mean. Let's look at an example. So in the table, you can see some uh, patient numbers on the left, and they were given an antihypertensive drug, 
and their reduction in blood pressure was recorded and those data are shown on the right. Six patients, six reductions in blood pressure in millimetres of mercury and so if you want to calculate the mean of those data you simply sum them up so 20 plus 25 plus 21 plus 34 plus 41 plus 37 divided by 6 and you get 29.67 millimetres of mercury. Relatively simple calculation I think. You probably have heard of median and mode, so we'll look at them briefly, but we're not going to use them for the rest of the lecture. But I thought I should at least define them so that you know what they are. Median is the central value and mode is the most frequent value of your data when they are arranged in numerical order. Now, there's a table on the screen and it's got uh, data from 15 tablets that were weighed. So tablet weight in the column as a function of tablet number. We're not using the same data as we were for calculation of mean just now. And the reason is because when you are looking at median and mode, you really need a sensible number of data points in the first place for those numbers to be meaningful. If you start just looking at three values, for instance, and you ask yourself which one is the median, it'll always be the middle, won't it? You're not, you're not really getting a, a very good answer there. So median and mode really apply themselves to larger data set. So there are 15 data in the table. If we line them up as shown on the screen, the median is the center point or the two center points if you have an even number of data and the mode is the most commonly occurring point, which in this instance, you can see there are two most commonly, commonly occurring numbers. 499 and 502. So in this case, the data are said to be bimodal. Interestingly, or not, depending on how you view it, if you were to calculate the mean of those data, the mean is 500.2. So you can see that they are relatively similar, aren't they? The, the median is 500, the mean is 500.2, and the mode 499 and 502. One thing, and it's a bit of a technical point, but I want to mention it at this point, is uh, the table of data contained uh, weights of tablets, 15 tablets from a sample of 100,000 tablets. So we have, uh, well, I should say a population of 100,000 tablets. So a production run was made, 100,000 tablets were produced. That is your population. You're not going to measure every tablet. You could do if the measurement is non-destructive. So in this particular instance, it was total tablet weight. That's a non-destructive measurement. So you could, if you really wanted to, you could weigh all 100,000 tablets, which is the most um, thorough way of getting a true re representation of the, of the production run. But in practice, you're probably not going to do that. You're going to sample a number of tablets from the production run, and you're going to measure those instead, especially if the test is destructive. So imagine you were not looking at total tablet weight. You were looking for drug content. That would be destructive because you have to dissolve the tablet into a solvent and then do some sort of HPLC separation, don't you? So you would destroy the tablets and you certainly wouldn't do a destructive assay on all of the um, population because you'd have nothing left to release to the market. So you are going to sample. And it's really important that when you sample, you sample a diverse range of that batch. You wouldn't, for instance, take the first 15 tablets that came out of the punch and die because you haven't really allowed all 100,000 tablets to come through and, and you're not accounting for any variability as the production run um, proceeds. So you might take some tablets from the start, some at the end, some in the middle. So you get a representative batch of tablets. So just to say population is the total sample. I've got to be careful of the word sample here, haven't I? Sample is a representative fraction of the population and you need to make sure it is representative of the whole. Otherwise, your statistical analysis is going to be wrong. Right, let's have a look at variability in data. And by variability, we mean precision and accuracy. The table on the screen shows you the results from four different students that have dug, done a drug content um, assay on a tablet. The tablet should contain 250 milligrams of drug. And so each student was given five tablets and they have determined what the content of drug was in each case. And the numbers are shown in the table. Now, looking at the table, do you think you could say with confidence whether each one of those students was operating accurately and or precisely? No, because it's very difficult, isn't it, to look at data in a table and say for certain what is going on. It's much easier if you plot the data and then you can see the trends visually. 
So let's do that. So on the screen in front of you are the same data, but now not in tabular form, but in graphical form. Mass of ibuprofen on the y-axis, student number on the x-axis. The individual data points are plotted in black squares. The means for each of the students' values are shown with a black arrow. And the solid line across the graph at 250 milligrams shows you the true answer. Right, so now it's your turn to have a think while I finish my cup of coffee. So let's look at student number one first. Look at their data and think to yourself, are they um, accurate and are they precise? So while I have a drink, you just have a think about that. Had a think? What do you think? Let's consider precision first. Precision means spread in the data. Are those data points pretty closely grouped together? The answer is yes. So that student is operating precisely. Accuracy relates to how close the mean of their data are it is to the true value. So that's shown by the black arrow. So the black arrow is very close to 250. Therefore, student number one is operating both accurately and precisely. Were we offering jobs to these four students, we would probably rank student number one as the best operator in the laboratory, wouldn't we? Because they appear to be both accurate and precise. What about student number two? Let's have a look at their data. Let's consider precision first. Precision relates to spread of data, remember? So looking at student number two, do you think they are precise or imprecise? Had a think. The answer is precise, isn't it? Because there's very little spread in their data. So students is operating precisely. What about accuracy? Has student number two operated accurately? Remember, accuracy means how close the mean of their data is to the true value, shown by the black arrow. So the answer is inaccurate, right? Because the arrow is nowhere near the 250 line. So student two is operating uh, precisely, but inaccurately. Let's look at student number three. What do you think about student number three? First, let's think about precision. Are they operating precisely or imprecisely? So the answer is, there's a lot of spread in their data, isn't there? So they're gonna be imprecise. Every time they make a measurement, they're getting a different answer. And accuracy, shown by the black arrow. How close is the black arrow to the line? Not close. So the student number three is both inaccurate and imprecise. So that's not a good combination for an employee, is it? And then student number four. Let's have a look at their data. Think first about precision. Spread in the data. They're quite spread, aren't they? So student number four is imprecise. Now let's look at the accuracy of student number four, shown by the arrow, which is the mean. The mean is actually quite close to the true value, isn't it? So funny enough, student four is accurate but imprecise. Now, the reason I show you these data uh, is for a number of reasons. <laughs> One, to reinforce the difference between accuracy and precision. That's kind of important. We don't need to talk about student number one because student number one has got the, the right answer and every time they make the measurement, they get the right answer, so that's good. Student number two, well, every time they've made a measurement, they've got the same answer, more or less, and so they're operating precisely, but that answer is not close to the real answer, and so they're inaccurate. Now that's usually a reflection of something wrong with either the instrument they're using, maybe it's miscalibrated for instance, or if there's a calculation involved that the student has in some way got the calculation wrong. Okay. The reason is because precision is about how they're operating in the laboratory, isn't it? And so every time they make a measurement, they're getting the same answer. So what they're doing is repeatable, but the answer is wrong. And so there's got to be a reason why it's wrong. It's usually one of those two things. If an answer is wrong by a factor of 10 or a half or it's double, it's a usual indicator that the, the calculation problem. I've had it many times where someone's come to me and they've said, all of my numbers are wrong by half, sir. It's a bit weird, isn't it? And I think well, it's not pro it's not weird. It means you've, what you've done is you've added two solutions together at some point and you've forgotten and you've miscalculated something. So if it's wrong by a factor of something, it's an indicator it's a calculation problem. And if it's wrong by something else, it's an indicator that the instrument isn't well calibrated. OK, so that's the sort of thing that you can get out from looking at the data. If you look at student number three, so that's um, imprecise and inaccurate. There's not a lot you can do with that sort of data. The student is 
is not operating consistently, which is why they're getting imprecision in their data. And at the same time, they're getting the wrong answer, which kind of implies they're not calculating something or the instrument's not good. So not a lot you can do with student three. Student four is an interesting one because they're operating imprecisely, which means every time they're doing something, let's say they're perpetuating something or um, transferring something, they're, they're doing it in rather a slapdash fashion. So they're, they're constantly getting it wrong. But as long as there's nothing else wrong, that the instrument's properly calibrated, the, the calculations are done properly, then on average, every time you um, over perpet something, another time you're probably going to under perpet something. So the more times you do a measurement, and the worse you are at repeatability, actually, the closer the mean of your data will get to the true answer. So if you see spread in data like that, and you see a mean which is close to the true answer, then actually it says there's nothing wrong with the instruments or the calculations. It's just the way that the operator is, is doing the actual experiment. And so a, a little bit of training should make those sets of data more precise. So I hope you can see that by looking at data and determining are they accurate and or precise, you can tell something about how the experiments were done and whether somebody needs training or whether instruments need looking at. So that's good. Right. Last part of the lecture. We're at the last part already, but that's good, isn't it? <laughs> but it's the hardest part. So um, sorry to let you down there. If we're going to look at distributions of data. So what does that mean? It means if we have a large population and we measure something. So in this instance, um, it's a mass of um, ibuprofen in a tablet. It should be 250 milligrams. If we take, say, 15 tablets and we measure how much ibuprofen is in each tablet, we expect 250 because the process is designed to make tablets with 250 milligrams of drug in. So therefore, if we plot the frequency on the y-axis with which we measure 250, it should be the highest. It should be the value that occurs most often. But that doesn't mean that there won't be tablets with, say, 249 or 251 milligrams in. That's equally like, not equally, slightly less likely, but it's still going to be quite common. So, so if we plot the frequency, it'll be slightly less than 250, but nonetheless, there will be a number of tablets with 249 or 251 milligrams. And as we move further away from the mean, there is a likelihood that we will measure that value, but that likelihood will reduce. And if we plot the frequency with which we measure a particular value, on the y-axis as a function of that value on the x-axis, typically we find that the data are distributed in some sort of curve like this. Usually, normally, that's an easy way to remember it, it would be a normal distribution or a Gaussian distribution. I'm going to come back to what that means in just a second. For now, it's important simply to recognise that if you have a large enough sample and you make enough measurements, then you will get a spread of values that you will measure and the most common value should be your expected answer, so the, the true answer. And as you move away from that value, the frequency with which you measure that value reduces. And so we get a distribution of data. I should point out at this point that we are talking about normal distributions. And if you ever see a paranormal distribution, it's probably a bit scary and you need to get out of the room. They're very common around Halloween, actually. So just bear that in mind should you do data analysis towards the end of October. Now, why are distributions useful? They are useful because they can be described mathematically. Now, you, you might not like the fact that there's a really big equation on the screen, uh, and I don't like it either, but the bottom line is it allows you to calculate some of these distributions, and that is very useful, as I shall show you in just a moment. So if you look at that equation on the screen, it looks a little bit scary. It says some function of your data, x is your data, is equal to 1 divided by sigma, so I'm going to come back to what that is in just a second. Multiplied by the square root of 2 pi, all div uh, multiplied by e to the power of minus x, which is your data point, minus the mean squared, divided by 2 sigma squared. It looks a little bit scary, but trust me, if it's, um, it's okay to use when you get going. The only new term in that equation is sigma. Sigma is a Greek letter for s, and so it's a term that starts with s, and it is in fact the standard deviation. Standard deviation is a term you've probably heard of, and it's really important. <laughs> it's a way of mathematically describing the spread in your data. OK, if you have a calculator that can do statistical analysis, I used to have one when I was at school. It was a very simple calculator. I still have it now, actually. It was solar powered 
really good value for money because it didn't cost very much and I've had it my whole uh, adult life, then what we'll often find is you'll see either an S or a Sigma on one of the keys and that is the standard deviation. It's calculating that based on the equation shown on the screen. So the standard deviation is given by the square root of the sum of, remember the big E means sum of, your data points minus the mean squared divided by n minus 1. So your calculator is actually putting those values through that equation and it's calculating the standard deviation. And the standard deviation relates to spread as I'll show you in just a second. One thing to note here, and it's a really technical point, so don't worry about it too much, is that the definition as written in that equation with n minus 1 on the bottom really applies to a sample set of data from a population, which, let's face it, is almost always going to be the case with the sort of data that you're going to be looking at. So 15 tablets from a batch of 100,000, you've got a sample data set, and so it's always n minus 1. In the rare and unlikely case that you are applying a standard deviation to a set of population data, then n minus 1 is replaced by n. And I think you might imagine that as the number of uh, data points increases, if the sample uh, proportion of the population starts to become very high, then the two terms essentially become the same, don't they? So it's just a technical point. It's important because some calculators, mine included, sometimes they say um, s and s minus 1, and sometimes they say sigma and sigma minus 1. It's really important when you use those functions to calculate standard deviation, because you're almost always looking at a sample set of data, not a population set of data, you really should use the s minus 1 or sigma minus 1. Um, button. You'll get a slightly different answer um, if you don't do that. Right, so the standard deviation essentially says I have a mean and it's a standard way of calculating a bit of spread in your data. So when people report data as a mean, plus or minus a standard deviation, I think you can imagine what that means. The mean is the central tendency in their data and the standard deviation is often taken to be uh, a degree of error in that measurement. I think you're familiar with that. So, if we were to look at a normal distribution, and rather than have actual data points on the x-axis, we simply had the mean in the centre, because the mean should be the, the middle point of your um, distribution, then you can move left and right one standard deviation. So the screen is showing you the mean in the centre, plus or minus one standard deviation. So you move left and right one standard deviation. Remember, that standard deviation is calculated, so we're not... We're not trying to estimate where that is on the x-axis. If we draw a vertical line at those points, plus minus one standard deviation, I hope you can see that you are encompassing some area under that curve. Okay. The question is, what fraction of the total area under this curve do you think is encompassed by the mean plus minus one standard deviation? The graph also shows you the mean plus minus two standard deviations. So the same question applies in that instance. Uh, what area of the curve do you think is encompassed by the mean plus or minus two standard deviations? So I'm going to give you just a second to think about that before I reveal the answer, because the answer can be a little bit surprising. OK, had a little think. The answers are... If you uh, look only at the mean plus minus one standard deviation, you are only really describing 68% of your data. Another way of thinking about that is to say, well, if I report a mean plus minus a standard deviation, 32% of my data actually fall outside of that um, limit. Now, I don't know about you, but I always find that quite surprising. When you look in a paper, people frequently report the data as mean plus minus a standard deviation. And then they start comparing two things. Maybe they've made two different formulations and they're comparing something about maybe their dissolution rate. And so there'll be a time for 90% release of drug for one formulation, plus minus the standard deviation, and a time for 90% release from the second formulation, plus minus standard deviation. And then you compare and you think, oh, actually, they do look different, don't they? I think it's quite illustrative to do the analysis again, but double the standard deviation. Because if you double the standard deviation, as you can see on the screen, 95% of your data should fall within that tolerance. So I think it's really a common mistake. People think 
The standard deviation is encompassing 95% of their data, and it isn't. It's encompassing 68% of the data, and you need to go to two standard deviations in order to encompass 95% of the data. So it's kind of interesting to look at someone's um, conclusions from a paper and to think to yourself, well, if I doubled these standard deviations, do I believe that the differences are still there? If you do, that's great. But if you don't, then you need to start looking uh, a bit more critically at these data because that truly is 95% confidence limit. Now, before I mention how we might use uh, distributions to, to, um, to do hypothesis testing, there's one other value that I just want to mention briefly, which is coefficient of variance, which you may or may not have heard of. The coefficient of variance is calculated as the standard deviation divided by the mean multiplied by 100. In other words, it's the percentage, how big a percentage your standard deviation is uh, of your mean. Um, and sometimes people report that because obviously the higher the number, the bigger the, the error on your measurement. Right, hypothesis testing is the last thing that we need to consider before Gary comes in and starts um, showing you hypothesis testing. So as long as we get through it in just a few minutes, you've got time for another cup of tea. And I think that's quite a good outcome from this lecture, don't you? So I hope you can see that the area under the curve of a distribution encompasses your entire data set. OK, uh, and as I just said, if you calculate your mean plus minus the standard deviation and you work out fractional areas, you can start to get some interesting insights into your data. One is that plus minus one standard deviation is only describing 68% of your data, for instance. So if we want to do hypothesis testing, the basis of a hypothesis is that something, a set of data, is either the same as or different from a different set of data. So let me give you an example. Let's say you are working in a factory and you make a batch of tablets. You've made 100,000 tablets and you've done the dissolution testing. You've got the time for 90% release or, or you've measured the um, average drug content, drug content in the tablets, 250 milligrams like we talked about before. Then you make a second batch of tablets, so another 100,000 tablets. The question is, are the new batch of tablets the same as the previous batch of tablets? So you've got some sample data from batch number one, some sample data from batch number two. Hypothesis testing says, are these two sets of data the same or different? How does it work? Imagine that you had um, drug content analysis like we did before. You'd have a distribution for batch number one and you have another distribution for batch number two. Assuming it's the same production run, and the tablets are the same, those two curves should lie on top of each other, shouldn't they? The mean is 250, the standard deviation is the same, so those two curves should look the same. So if you were to plot them on top of each other, they would essentially be the same. If the second batch was significantly different from the first batch, then it would have a different mean, tablet content, drug content. Let's say, for argument's sake, it's 245 on average, rather than 250. That would have the consequence of moving the distribution for the second batch one side relative to the first batch. And the two distributions would be next to each other and there would be a small degree of overlap between them. So I hope you can see that if you compare what fraction of the area of the curves are overlaying, it allows you to say whether two curves are the same or different. If you were to compare the areas of overlap and they were 100%, the two areas were 100% the same, the two curves are on top of each other, and so therefore they are indistinguishable and they would be the same. If the batch of second tablets was massively different from the first one, the distribution for the second batch is in a completely different part of that graph from the distribution for the first batch, and the two curves would in principle be side by side. The amount of overlap in area would be very, very small, wouldn't it? And so if the amount of overlapping area is small, then you can say they are different. And this is the basis of hypothesis testing. It simply says if you have two distributions and you set up how you want to compare them, and come back to that in just a second, it simply says if the degree of overlap in those areas is large, they are going to be the same. And if they are small, the overlap is small, they are different. And when you set a tolerance, uh, sometimes you have a p-value, you know, you've seen that, p equals 0 0.1, 0 0.01, 0 0.001, whatever it is, all that is doing is it's setting an arbitrary value for how much the um, curves overlap. If the value is to one side of that, 
then they and they're not overlapping they are different and if it's to the other side and they are overlapping they are the same that's the basis of all hypothesis testing you're simply comparing two distributions and you're saying what proportion of the area under the curve overlaps and and you set an arbitrary limit above which you say they're different and below which you say they're the same it's as, it's as simple as that the same is true for instance if you had um, a clinical trial result and you were testing say a sleeping tablet on um, the number of hours of unbroken sleep of a group of patients then you're going to have one distribution for the placebo group and one distribution for the group that have been taking the sleeping tablet and it's the same deal if they overlap the, the areas are essentially the same and as they start to separate the amount of overlapping area reduces and it's a simple question to say right at what point do I accept that the area of overlap becomes small enough that I accept these two are different now there are some important points here one of which I alluded to already um, which is that you've got to set up the the test in order to work out how to compare your areas under the curves now a simple example I'm coming back to the mass of a tablet uh, mass of a drug in a tablet again because it's very handy is on the screen uh, distribution for our tablets 250 milligrams expected um, drug content if the question is what proportion of tablets in my batch have less than 245 milligrams for argument's sake then we can draw an arrow on the distribution as shown at 245 milligrams any tablet below that is out of specification any tablet above that is within specification and we can work out what fraction of tablets fall outside of our specification because it will be the area under the curve to the left of the arrow um, divided by the total area multiplied by 100 and that will give us our percentage of tablets outside of the specification if we did that the outer specification tablets are only on one side of the distribution they're, they're 245 or less anything above 245 is fine that's called a one-tailed test because we're simply asking a question about one side of the distribution if we asked a different question and the question was what proportion of our tablets contain either plus or minus or are within plus or minus uh, five milligrams of our expected 250 milligrams then we have the situation shown on the screen now which is that an out of specification tablet would either be below 245 milligrams or above 255 milligrams and so to calculate what fraction of tablets are out of specification it would be the area under the curve to the left of 245 milligrams and the area under the curve above 255 milligrams this is a two-tailed test because it's looking at both sides of the distribution not a single side so it's kind of important when you when you set up the question that you're going to ask in your hypothesis testing that you understand in terms of areas under the curve am i just simply comparing one side of my distribution with another distribution or am i comparing both sides because it becomes either a one-tailed test or a two-tailed test but i'm very certain that Gary will talk about that in just a moment the other thing that I want to point out is that although a normal distribution is uh, normal the bottom line is it's calculated from the equation that I showed you earlier and so it is possible that we can have many many different shapes of distributions um, and they are all normal it's very easy to think it's just a broad distribution like this but actually the shape can vary enormously they're still normal distributions okay so to demonstrate this point I've calculated some normal distribu distributions from the equation I showed you just now so on the screen as um, four different distributions it's the same mean so all the distributions are centered at the same point on my graph but they have different standard deviations two three four and five and I hope you can see that as the standard deviation starts to get bigger, the distribution gets lower and broader. It's always centered around the same value because the mean is the same, but the shape of the curve is becoming lower and broader. Same deal if I recalculate with different means, but the same standard deviations, the actual shapes of the curves look the same, but then they move on the x-axis relative to each other. So it's just to say, you've got to be a little bit careful that a normal distribution can have many, many different shapes. And it's kind of important it's kind of important because the whole basis of hypothesis testing is to compare two different distributions and most importantly it's about um, it's about assessing what proportion of those distributions overlap with each other I hope you can see that since there are many many different types of distributions because there are many many different means and standard deviations 
we can end up with an infinite number of distributions and therefore the questions that we ask about comparing two different distributions with each other there is also an infinite number of those as well and so it's going to be a right nightmare to try and calculate fractional areas under these curves in order to, to do some sort of statistical analysis and this is something that was recognized many many years ago <laughs> And so in order to get around this problem or to compensate for this problem, then mathematically you can do a number of tricks to try and standardise your distribution. So I hope you can see that the mean and the standard deviation for your set of data could in principle have any value and therefore you could have any um, normal distribution. But if you standardised your distribution to a reference point, someone can calculate the partial areas under this curve for the for the standardized curve and they are available in tables of data and you can use those tables of data as the basis of your hypothesis testing and it doesn't matter what your mean and standard deviation are because you've standardized them to a particular value now if you're not following what i'm saying that's totally fine you can stop this video and watch it again later in the privacy of your own front room or Gary will probably say the same thing in just a second. So feel free to panic at this point and, and, and not understand what I'm saying because it will become clearer at some point. But the, the basic principle of standardizing here is that you take your distribution which could have any set of values and you standardize it to a set of values which, for which areas have been calculated. The easiest way of doing this is to set the mean as zero and the standard deviation as one. If you go back to the equation that I showed you earlier and you put in some data with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one, you'll always get the same curve. It'll always be centered in the same place on the x-axis and it will have the same um, broadness because the standard deviation is a constant, right? So if you set your mean to zero and your standard deviation to one, you're going to get a standardized distribution irrespective of what data you're analyzing. The thing you've got to think about is how? How do I do that? How do I transform my actual data set to this standardized curve with a mean of zero and a standard deviation of one? And the answer is mathematically, it's really simple. If you want to get the mean of your data to be zero, all you have to do is subtract the mean of your data from every data point. <laughs> so if we think about the data I showed you just now, which was for um, drug content in tablets, the mean was 250 milligrams more or less if I subtract 250 milligrams from every data point the curve is going to look the same but it's going to move on the x-axis and be centered around zero isn't it so if I subtract the mean from every data point I haven't changed the shape of my curve I've just moved it on my x-axis and so it's centered around zero and then you've got to think to yourself how am I going to get a standard deviation of one and the answer is you divide everything by the standard deviation because the standard deviation divided by the standard deviation is one. So you then divide every data point by the standard deviation. So if you think about that, you take each individual data point, which is uh, x on, on the equation, you subtract the mean, so x minus the mean, that will move the distribution so that it's centered around zero, and you divide by the standard deviation, that will set the standard deviation to one. If you do that, it's got a special name, it's called a Z transformation. So the screen shows an equation which reads Z equals X minus mu divided by sigma. And all that is doing is it is generating a standardized distribution which will be centered at zero and with a standard deviation of one. In practice, the Z transformation doesn't work very well unless you've got a really large sample relative to your population. 15 tablets from a batch of 100,000 is not a large sample relative to the population. And so the sorts of data you're probably going to be analysing, the Z transformation doesn't work that well. And in uh, practice, a different transformation is applied. It's mildly more complicated, but the principle is the same. It's called a T transformation. I'm sure you might have um, heard of that. Somebody says, I've done a T test. OK, what they've really done is they've done the T transformation on their data which has produced a standard normal distribution and then they've used a set of tables to to do their hypothesis testing as Gary will go through in just a moment a T transformation is shown on the screen it simply says your data point minus the mean that's the same it will center around zero in this instance is divided by um, a standard deviation that should be a sigma in that um, equation by the way so a sigma divided by the square root of um, 
the number of data points and that will give you your T transformation. And it's the same deal. You can go and look up in tables of data, such as the book that I recommended at the start, uh, the fractional areas under the, those curves, and that allows you to compare one data set with another. Right, and with that, we are done. You'll be pleased to know. On time and on budget. It's time for you to go and get another cup of tea, and then you can focus on what Gary is going to show you in just a second. I need to summarise by saying a number of things. So, one, it's really important when you've got a set of data that you look at those data and you assess the uncertainty in them. If the uncertainty is huge uh, and the error is a gross error, ignore those data and get them resent to you because there's no point. You can't interpret them in, in any sensible way. If you trust the data, look at the uncertainty and decide, have you got a systematic error or a random error? If it's a random error, then the spread in the data are going to be quite wide. The data are imprecise. Imprecise data is usually a result of, of um, the operator not operating consistently. So if you see imprecision in the data, you know, you can go and talk to that person and say, right, you need to focus a bit more on doing this experiment a bit more repeatedly. and The precision should get better. On the other hand, if you have a systematic error, it's probably related to accuracy. So you may have a spread in the data or you may not, but the answer is not the true answer. And that is usually a reflection of a calculation or an instrument that needs calibrating. And so that would be a systematic error. So if you can see the difference between a, a random error and a systematic error, you're actually determining whether the data were recorded uh, precisely or accurately. And that allows you to go and feed back to that person about what might be going on. It's important to recognize that when you've got a sample set of data from a population and you make that measurement, you're going to get a range of values. And the more uh, values that you uh, make, the more you'll see them form into a distribution. And that distribution should be normally distributed. Normal distribution means they can be described mathematically. And the most important thing about a normal distribution is it allows you to calculate a standard deviation, which is essentially a quantifiable amount of precision in the data. Your mean plus minus one standard deviation is only encompassing 68% of your data. The mean plus minus two standard deviations is actually uh, encompassing 95% of your data. And then the last thing to remember is hypothesis testing essentially says I take the distribution from one set of data and I compare it with the distribution from a different set of data. The question is always in hypothesis testing, are two things the same or different? If they are the same, the overlapping area will be quite high. And if they are different, the overlapping area will be quite small. And the answer to the question is something the same or different is simply a mathematical one based on a specific proportion of the overlapping area. And because distributions can take any shape, because there's an infinite number of means and standard deviations, the best way of comparing two different distributions is to standardize them before comparing. And they're of the numerous ways of standardizing, the best ones are the Z transformation and the T transformation. Right, I hope that's helpful. I hope it's time left. You can go and get a cup of tea and I will see you in a couple of weeks time when we're going to talk about DSC and physical form transformation.